Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello learners, welcome to session 3 of training and development course. Today in this lecture, we will delve into the intricacies of designing effective training programs. In this session, we will explore the principles of instructional designs, creating engaging and interactive training sessions. Then. We will also be talking about incorporating adult learning principles, developing the objectives for training and last but not the least, we will talk about facilitation of training with focus on trainers, trainees, peer support, etc. So, let us get started. Before we delve deeper into the session, let me just give you an insight into what instructional design is. So, instructional design is the process of creating the learning experiences and materials in a systematic and efficient manner to facilitate the effective acquisition of knowledge and skills. So, it is an important process for creating the learning experience for the individuals and material in a very systematic manner, so as to ensure that the knowledge, skills, abilities of the individuals for which the training is meant is properly transferred to the individuals. Now, it is important for us to understand the various principles of instructional design. So, when we talk about the various principles of instructional designs, there can be multiple such principles. For example, we have need analysis, we have clear learning objective setting, instructional strategies for the employees, assessment and feedback of the individuals accessibility and inclusivity as some of the important constituents. So, the very first principle of instructional design is need analysis. In the previous lecture, we saw the importance of need analysis. So, before designing any training program, it is important and it is very crucial for us to understand and conduct a thorough analysis of the training need. To identify the specific learning needs, the objectives of training and the constraints which are associated with the training. By means of a small case let that I would like to present here, I would like to elucidate the example uh, you know the uh, importance of need analysis. So, there was this manufacturing company which was noticing a constant decline in the productivity of the concern and suspected that it was due to outdated machinery. However, when they conducted need analysis to delve deeper into the problem, they realized that the issue stemmed from inadequate employee training on the new software integrated into the machinery. So, it was not because of the outdated machinery issue that the organization initially suspected, but the major issue was primarily related to inadequate employee training. So, this helped an organization decide on giving the appropriate employee training to the individuals. So, this is about need analysis. So, by means of it, I think it is very much clear that how and why need analysis has to be done in an appropriate manner. 
the second principle of instructional design is clear learning objectives. So, it is about clearly defining the learning objectives. Right at the outset, the objectives of the training have to be decided. And usually, the objectives of training are the outcome of the extensive training need analysis, which we do, which may be in the form of organizational analysis, task analysis or individual analysis. So, we clearly define the learning objectives by providing the directions for the individual design processes and help learners understand what they are expected to achieve. So, right in the beginning of the training program, it is very important for us to communicate to our learners that these are the various objectives and these are the topics that would be taken care of. This would definitely enhance the learning experience for the individuals for they know in the beginning of the training program itself that what is this training meant for. There is a small caselet to define it better. A language school sets clear learning objectives for each level of proficiency, ensuring that the students know exactly what skills what they will they develop at the end of the course. For example, if I am imparting some emotional intelligence related training to a set of employees. So, it is very important for me to clearly tell about what they are expected to learn and what are the objectives of the learning to them. So, it may be in the form of providing them some kind of understanding of what self awareness is, what self regulation is. It may be something related to giving them gain, you know, making them gain an insight into the objectives related to mo motivation. It may be something related to giving them some kind of insights on motivation of the employees and also empathy related things. So, such kind of things have to be communicated to the people right at the beginning of the training session. Next is instructional strategies. Now, choosing the appropriate instructional strategies is important and has to be based on the learning objectives, audience characteristics and available resources to enhance their learning outcomes. So, it can be a single strategy for imparting the learning to the individuals or it can be a blend of various strategies that may be adopted to enhance the learning outcomes for the individuals that may be adopted. And prior to designing these appropriate uh, you know, instructional strategies, it is important to understand the learning objectives of the people. It is important for us to understand what kind of characteristics are associated with the audience that we are trying to tackle. What are the available resources with us that would enhance the learning outcome, right. So, a case study in this context could be an IT company implemented a blended learning approach, which combines online modules with hands on workshops to train employees on new programming languages effectively. Let me uh, tell you, for example, there is some training program meant for the individuals who would learn business analytics or data analytics after the training. So, right in the beginning itself, we would be laying the objectives for the individuals, stating that these are the important takeaways from the data analytics course. Alongside, it is very important for the organization to design the right kind of industrial strategies, instructional strategies. Now, what would those instructional strategies be in context of data analytics and something like business analytics? So, I think it would be inappropriate if we do not use the hands on workshop for our employees or set of people who would be attending these kinds of programs. And also, it is important for us to train them on some important softwares which can help them in honing their skills on data analytics and business analytics maybe. So, such kind of instructional st strategies have to be 
kept in mind based on the kind of audience characteristics we have, based on the kind of learning objectives. And uh, before designing the strategies, the important you know prerequisites for the learners also have to be taken into consideration. Because for data analytics, if we are right away starting with Python and uh, people do not have any idea of what Python is and we are trying to explain everything uh, using the Python uh, software, it would be inappropriate. So, some prior knowledge is supposed to be seen first of all that the individual possesses that set of knowledge or not and uh, then after that we may go on. So, making them move from one level to other is again an important issue that needs to be addressed. Next is about assessment and feedback. So, continuous assessment mechanism has to be de devised and uh, it is important for them to allow the trainers to gauge learners progress and adjust the training program as needed. So, during the training program, the assessment and feedback have to be an integral part of the system. For example, here is a small caselet suggesting a customer service training program incorporates regular quizzes and role playing exercises, providing immediate feedback to the participants and enabling them to address areas which need improvement promptly. Similarly, we may have n number of such examples wherein by means of assessments and feedback people will be able to gauge into what are the areas that need immediate att attention. It will give a clear cut idea to the trainer also to get to know about the various aspects that need to be touched upon and also it will help them in understanding their progress better. So, this was the fourth aspect of the principle of instructional design. Next we have accessibility and inclusivity. So, this is again an important principle of instructional design which is about designing the training program that accommodates diverse learning styles, abilities, backgrounds, ensuring equitable learning opportunity for all the participants. So, you have to understand the diverse learning styles of people like for example, there are people who are visual learners, there are people who are auditory learners, there are you know there may be audiences uh, which may be interested in some kind of kinesthetics learning right. So, all right, so it is very important for us to make a note of all these learning styles and preferences of the people, so that they are able to assimilate better, so that they are able to understand things in a better manner. So, after you know after incorporating these styles maybe the fashion in which the training program is designed becomes better. So, understanding your uh, you know understanding your audience better, understanding the diverse learning styles of people, the ability level of the individuals, the backgrounds of people where they come from and the kind of uh, educational background they carry in, in case of software the knowledge of software may be very very important and instrumental. So, this these things will definitely ensure equitable learning opportunity for all the participants. Then there may be people with special needs. So, we need to address those special needs also. So, a caselet offers I mean this is a caselet about a university that offers captioned videos, braille material and also the sign language interpreters to make their courses accessible to people with disabilities. So, how wonderful it is if the organization is using some such kind of features and then trying to provide with all kinds of braille material, the sign language interpreters etcetera, so as to help their learners understand things in a better manner. The entire idea of uh, you know having a very concrete in the instructional design would be fulfilled and would become more concrete if these principles are very well taken care of. Now, we move to the other segment wherein we will be talking about creating engaging and interactive training sessions. So, the training sessions have to be very very engaging, they have to be very very 
interesting and they have to be very very interactive also. So, there are various ploys which can be employed to make the training an experience for the individuals, wherein they are not just attending the training program, but then they are learning a lot and the takeaways are brought back to the organization and then they are implementing those things. So, how can we uh, foster such kind of culture? How can we uh, do all these things? How can we create such engaging and interactive training sessions for the individuals? Right. So, the very first is use of multimedia. In the previous slide, we just talked about the different learning styles. We talked about visual learners, we talked about the auditory learners, we talked about kinesthetics learners. Right. So, there are different sets of people who learn from various different interventions. For example, there are people who are who may be interested in learning through visual uh, appeals that we include in the presentations, maybe by means of the you know bar diagrams, the charts, the uh, various other things that we use in the presentations. And then there may be possibility then there are people who are learning more from listening to things. You know, they would be more interested in listening to uh, things. They would be interested in some kind of podcasts. They would be interested in listening to some kind of audios, etc. So those kinds of employees are uh, so, so those, those kinds of learners are what you refer to in as the auditory learners. And then there are sets of people who are able to gain more from the training that is imparted to them through hands-on experiences, through hands-on sessions. So that's the category of kinesthetic learners. And it can be a blend of techniques that can be followed to make the sessions more engaging and more interactive. Now, let me tell you about the first one, which is use of multimedia. So, incorporating more of video content, interactive presentations and simulations captivates learners attention and enhance information retention. So, we may say that there is a direct correlation between these two things that is the use of multimedia and info retention. One of the research which was conducted in this context and in fact several researches which are conducted in this context have clearly talked about the inclusion of multimedia presentation increasing the learning retention by up to 50 percent. So, you tend to retain more when you see those visual impacts, when you get to learn about the visual impacts, when you see the uh, diagrams, when you see the presentations, interactive presentation, infographics, incorporating videos, etc. So, these things certainly le uh, you know lead to better information retention. Then is in order to foster a culture of creating engaging and interactive training session it is very important to seek the active participation of people. So, encouraging active participation through group discussions, case studies, hands on activities would promote deeper understanding and application of concepts. So, we have to be very very clear on how do we want to you know bring about that kind of active participation, how to you know keep the people engaged in the entire process of teaching and learning. So, active learning methods result in around 20 to 30 percent improvement in the learning outcomes compared to the passive methods. So, we need to make use of more of active learning methods, which include more of stimulating discussions, case studies, uh, you know inclusion in the uh, training programs, hands on activities for the people, so on and so forth. Like for example, as I was mentioning about that workshop on emotional intelligence. And when I am telling them about something related to self awareness. So, if I am just giving them the definition of self awareness and letting them know that self awareness is about identifying the strengths, weaknesses of an individual, and it is about knowing yourself in detail, this would not create an impact. Rather, if I, if I come up with some kind of assessment for them, wherein they get to know about what are they good at, what are they not good at what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. Such activities would make them feel more engrossed in the process. They will feel more engaged in the process and thereby uh, would be able to understand them better and would be able to you know uh, uh, this way you know the, the, the 
uh, and this way uh, the training program would be more effective. So we may include some kind of assessments for the people, we may go for some kind of uh, analysis for the people, we may go for uh, some kind of need drive pattern identity, identification for the people like exercises and we may go for n number of such methods which can actively involve in the process. Like for example, there can be another example of active uh, participation among people. These days there are a lot of uh, leaderboards, there are something, some very active uh, participation uh, methods like for example, there is something called Skahoot which will give you a very uh, real time analysis of uh, your, I mean it would give you a very real time assessment of uh, your uh, standing vis-a-vis -vis the other competitors who are in the process. So, a small challenge can bring a lot of difference and can definitely be very, very instrumental in making the learning teaching experience fun for the people as well. So, this can be one of the examples of uh, this active learning methods result in 20 to 30 percent improvement in the learning outcomes and uh, you know you may have uh, various methods included in it rather than going for passive methods which tend to be very, very boring you know you can reduce this monotony, you can reduce the boredom by incorporating some active learning methods. We may even go for some case studies wherein uh, people are made to participate in the case studies, people are made to participate in some kind of role plays, they are giving some kind of hands on experience to do a practical thing so that they learn a lot during the entire process. Next is about gamification. So, when we talk about gamification, it is about introducing the elements of gamification such as points, badges, leaderboards as I was just mentioning the previous slide, motivating the learners and it definitely makes the training experience more enjoyable. So, to you know to include the element of fun and motivation clubbed with some kind of challenges at times can really create a phenomenal difference. An organization that takes that incorporate gamification into their training program see a 30 to 60 percent which is a phenomenal increase in the employee engagement levels. So, certainly including more of gamifications and uh, you know wherein people get some kind of they earn some kind of points, they earn some kind of badges, there are leaderboards these things you know put some kind of challenges at work and they also motivate the learners and make the training programs, training experiences more enjoyable. So, it is very important for us to take this thing into consideration while designing our training program. Next is real world relevance. So, why do people relate to things? What would people relate to? So, people would relate to something that happens in real world scenarios. So, relating training content to real world scenarios and job responsibilities would foster relevance and encourage active participation. So, rather than uh, just coming up with your own lecture and going to the people and telling them about what is happening all around, it is very important to actively put them into a situation wherein they relate, wherein they could relate to the job responsibilities, the real world scenarios, uh, this would definitely foster relevance and encourage the active engagement among the individuals. For example, for example, uh, a sales training program uses real customer scenarios and role playing exercises to help participants apply sales techniques effectively. So, certainly such kind of things can highly be highly instrumental in uh, shaping the entire experience for the individuals and they would be more relating to things and the takeaways of the learning program, the takeaways of the training uh, aspects would be far more than they, uh, you know they would be otherwise. So, it is about uh, creating the real world relevance for the people. Now, uh, we move to the next principle of our adult, you know, we, we move to some of the key principles of adult learning, right. So, uh, when we talk about this uh, process, let me just apprise you of something called as andragogy and pedagogy. 
So, there are two things which are important in this context in context of adult learning. So, the very first is andragogy and then we have something called as pedagogy. Now, what is the basic point of difference between these things or what is it all about? So, andragogy is the methods and practices of teaching the adults. Whereas, when it comes to pedagogy, it is about methods and practices of teaching the children. So, there is a lot of difference in the way in which the children are taught and the adults are taught, but then there can be certain level of similarities also. So, when we talk about pedagogy, it is about methods and practices of teaching the children and uh, andragogy has something to do with methods and practices of teaching the adults. So, today we are going to talk about some of the important key principles of adult learning or what we can call as andragogy. So, the very first principle of adult learning is self directed learning. So, when we talk about self directed learning, what does it mean? It means that the adults would prefer to take responsibility for their own learning. So, training program should allow them for more of autonomy and self paced learning. It is seen after extensive research that usually the adults would be more interested in going for more of autonomy. They would want more of freedom. They would not want to learn at somebody else's pace. Rather, they would be more interested in learning at their own pace. So, self-paced learning is something which is preferred more by the adults as compared to the children. So, research has suggested that self-directed learning results in 20 to 30 percent increase in knowledge retention. When they are learning at their own pace, when they are uh, going for more of self-directed learning, then certainly they are able to experience things at a better rate and there is more of knowledge retention in this case. Then uh, we have relevance to experience. So, adults bring a wealth of experience to the learning environment. So, training content should be relevant and applicable to their existing knowledge and skills. As I was mentioning about that example related to emotional intelligence. So, if I am telling some people about or if I am training the people on emotional intelligence, then they would expect a lot of things. They also would carry along with them a lot of prior knowledge related to what the topic was all about. So, when they come and attend the training program, they would already be having a reservoir of knowledge. So, what they bring to the table is one thing and what I am bringing to the table and how I am adding value and knowledge to their already existing database is something which is going to create a phenomenal difference. If somebody comes with certain expectations and their expectations are not fulfilled right at the outset in the beginning itself or maybe throughout the training program, they would be a little dissatisfied. So, what value creation are you doing? How you are trying to create the difference? What relevance are you bringing to their experience would also be an important concern to address. So, training content should be relevant and applicable to their current knowledge and skills. That is the reason why it is uh, said that if you are going to teach the individuals, uh, the usually the uh, individuals who are uh, taking their executive learning or say they are into their executive training programs, that would be very different from the people who are uh, just the beginners. So, you have to be very, very careful and wise in choosing the right kinds of uh, methodologies and also you have to be very wise in understanding the relevance that you take forward to the experience which they carry. So, training programs that leverage learners existing knowledge and experiences see a 15 to 20 percent, 25 percent improvement in the engagement and retention level. And this engagement and retention, they are not just keywords, they are not just the buzzwords, but they are really instrumental in making your training program successful. It is seen that those training programs which involve a lot of active learning and uh, which has a lot of uh, good retention uh, rate or uh, which fosters a culture of uh, engagement throughout are definitely instrumental for organizational growth and success. And therefore, it is important to 
uh, take care of this thing. Apart from uh, these things, there are some other aspects also that we have to take care of when it comes to, you know, your uh, adult learning principles. We may go for something called as problem centered approach. So, it is seen that adults learn better when presented with the real world problem to solve, as it promotes critical thinking and also application of their knowledge. As we have been focusing on the point that adults carry a lot of knowledge base with them, they are a reservoir of knowledge when they come to attend some kind of training program or when they come for some kind of learning. So, certainly if they are able to put that knowledge into practice, if they are able to put what they have learned throughout into practice, they would be able to engage in a better manner and they would be able to understand things in a better manner. So, definitely uh, problem based learning increases the learner satisfaction and statistics are there to show that 20 to 30 percent increase in learning satisfaction level uh, happens uh, when they are actively involved in some kind of problem centered approach rather than the traditional lecture based methods. So, lecture based methods have become very, very conventional, they have become very old and traditional ways of uh, delivering the training programs. Moreover, we need to focus on more of activity based learning platforms, the, uh, the problem centered approach towards learning, bringing relevance to experience of the individuals when they come to learn. So, in conclusion, designing effective training programs would require a comprehensive understanding of uh, the industrial uh, you know uh, instructional design principles that we follow the strategies for creating engaging and uh, uh, interactive uh, sessions for the people and incorporating the appropriate uh, appropriate and adequate adult learning principles at work now next thing is what you what uh, I mean next thing which is really important in this context is about uh, the fact that how do we develop the objectives for training. So, when we are developing these objectives for training, all the objectives that are developed for the training program are important and there are few terms which are all the more important. So, the very first term is trainee reactions. So, the term trainee reaction refers to the objectives set for how trainees should feel about training. How would they feel about the training program? So, these reactions are offered, uh, you know, often considered the first levels of evaluation in Kirkpatrick's training evaluation model and focus on how trainee feel about the training experience. So, there can be several aspects of it. I would just like to highlight some of the important aspects of uh, you know the trainee reaction. So, when it comes to trainee reactions, you know what really counts is what is the initial reaction of the trainee soon after he attends the training program. Was he really satisfied with the training? And believe it or not, one can very well figure out during the training program itself that what is the satisfaction level of the individual. This can be very well fetched by the active engagement of people in the training program. And definitely it includes various factors such as training content that you have given to the people, the kind of uh, you know materials that you have uh, facilitated the people with, then uh, the kind of training facilitators that you have, right, uh, how engaging they are, how engrossing they are, how, how people find it, right. Then we have uh, something called as after the satisfaction level, we have something called as perceived usefulness. So, right in the beginning, the pe people would like to first of all weigh the training program on certain aspects. They would see what is the perceived usefulness, trainees perception of the relevance and applicability of the training program to their jobs would definitely be an important point. Then is how engaged to the field. So, trainee reaction is actually the outcome of a satisfaction level, the engagement level, the perceived usefulness of the training program, the kind of comfort and support he 
found during the training program. For example, if you have a supportive uh, trainer and you feel that you are very comfortable all throughout, so this would uh, definitely enhance your learning experience and this would definitely have an impact on the entire teaching learning experience. So, it is an important concern that needs to be addressed. So, evaluating training reactions helps trainers and organization assess the effectiveness of the training program. So, positive training reactions are generally associated with increased motivation. So, if you have positive training reactions, it can be directly associated with and related with increased motivation to learn, then uh, they would be more satisfied and definitely it would lead to better learning outcomes after the training is delivered. So, this was about trainee reaction. Next, we move to trainee learning objective. So, when you talk about training, trainee learning objective, it describes the specific knowledge, skills, abilities that the trainees are expected to acquire. So, as a result of participating in the training program. So, these objectives focus on trainee learning objective is the important concern and uh, some of the key aspects of training learning objective would include knowledge acquisition, the skill development the behavioral changes that happen as a consequence of training, have they been able to improve their problem solving capabilities or and abilities as a result of training. So, these are some of the important training uh, objectives that are supposed to be uh, there. So, the objectives should be focusing on trainees acquisition of some factual knowledge, have they been able to understand something about the factual knowledge, some new information some concepts, some principles, maybe uh, the theories relevant to the tasks and roles, are they able to relate it better? Then it is about skill development. So, trainees development of practical skills, techniques, procedures and uh, you know methods required to perform task effectively is the important concern. Then after that behavioral changes. So, trainees demonstration of the desired behaviors in form of the attitude, in form of the approaches in performing job related tasks is again an important concern. Then is about problem solving abilities. So, trainees ability to apply acquired knowledge and skills to analyze the problem, make decisions and to solve the real world work situation would also be there. So, training, trainee learning objectives provide a road map for designing and delivering the content. So, what is the trainee learning objective would actually help us in designing the training program in an effective manner and the content, uh, how is it to be delivered to the people, activities and assessments that need to be incorporated in the training program. Uh, so, that uh, the KSAs of the individuals are improved. Then the third term is transfer of training objectives. So, transfer of training objective would describe the change in the job behavior that is expected to occur as a result of transferring the KSAs. So, it is very important for us to let the people know about how the training objectives would be transferred or what would be the transfer of training objectives. So, how the trainees would be able to apply to uh, you know would be able to apply the acquired knowledge, skills and techniques to perform job tasks efficiently, how do they adopt to, uh, you know how do they adapt to the changing demands, the job demands of people, uh, then continuous improvement the trainees commitment to continuous improvement and you know 
learning and development, seeking opportunities to enhance their skills, everything would count a lot here. And transfer of training objectives are very, very critical for ensuring that the training efforts translate into the tangible improvements. So, how you are actually translating the training efforts into the tangible job performance or tangible uh, improvements in the job performance would really matter a lot. And here is what the role of reinforcement of the uh, entire process would come into play because there is a tendency of the individuals that they learn, they assimilate, but when they get back to their work and start working with the practices, they find their previous and older ways of work more convenient to use. So, here the role of co-workers, the supervisors, the uh, seniors come into play because a culture has to be developed in the organization that the learning that they have done or the change which they have uh, just been able to acquire or the training which they have just been part of, that thing has to percolate deep within and this would only be possible if the right kind of reinforcement is done in order to freeze what they have learned. So, in summary, the training reaction, the trainee reaction, the trainee learning objectives and transfer of training objectives are interconnected aspects of the training design the training delivery and evaluation. So, positive training reactions contribute to more engaging and you know more satisfy, satisfying uh, experiences of people while effective achievement of learning objectives uh, would facilitate the transfer of acquired KSAs to the job context leading to improved productivity, improved performance and enhanced job satisfaction level thereby leading to organizational success at large. Now, it is time to understand some important aspects of identifying the objectives for training. So, with the help of training need analysis, we can determine a lot of things. For example, the performance deficiencies can be addressed and uh, should be addressed by training. We get to know about the knowledge, skills, abilities required to be learned in order to change the behavior of the individuals. So, when it comes to a good objective for the training program, it has to have certain important components. Now, what are they and how do we actually devise uh, a good mechanism for chalking out the objectives for the training program. Now, the very first aspect here is desired outcome. Desired outcome refers to the specific goal or result that we are targeting at that an individual, organization, team or individual aims to achieve through particular action or initiative. So, it defines the desired outcome to be achieved. It specifies the context or environment in which the desired outcome can be realized. So, conditions set the stage for action and provide the necessary context for achieving the desired output or desired result. For example, if the desired outcome is to increase the sales revenue, the condition may include factors such as market demand. So, under what conditions can desired outcome be uh, achieved? It can be achieved under certain situations and some of the examples could be market demand, customer preferences, competition existing in the organization, you know in the uh, outside market, then sales team performance. So, achieving the desired outcome of increased sales revenue is contingent upon certain things like market demand, customer preferences, competition, sales performance, etcetera. Now, would come the other aspect that is standards. 
So, a good objective should also have some kind of standards set. For example, what criteria signify that the outcome is acceptable? So, you have to put it in concrete terms. It is always better to quantify the criteria. So, for example, if the desired outcome is to improve the customer satisfaction, the standards may include various metrics. Again, the moment we use metrics, it is METRICS metrics. So, the moment we talk about metrics, it suggests or it is suggestive of some kind of some kind of quantification, right? So, in case we want to improve the uh, customer satisfaction and that is the desired outcome which we are targeting at, which we are looking at, the various metrics could be customer feedback rating, right? Then we have net promoter score as one of the other criteria. Customer retention rate could be yet another criteria, right? So, meeting or exceeding the predefined standards increase, you know, uh, that they indicate that the desired outcome of improved customer satisfaction has been achieved. So, this is how we uh, think on the lines of developing a good objectives for the training program. Now, there is a specific formula that has to be followed for writing objectives. Like for example, uh, the formula would include the desired behavior, it would include the conditions and it would finally include the standards also. So, all those things that we learned in the previous slide wherein we described at large about the desired outcome, condition and standards, it is now time to put it into practice and write the formula for writing objectives. So, it is about writing the desired behavior. So, the here the verb needs to de describe clearly what needs to be done. For example, some of the verbs can be counting, placing, installing, etc. Now, adding conditions like with the use of computer, without the use of computer, without the use of manual or whatever the condition is, whatever condition we want to put here would be put in place and uh, has to be clearly communicated while writing the objectives. And finally, the standards are to be used like following the safety measures within 15 minutes, it has to be very, very, uh, you know, concrete and it has to be told uh, to the individuals well in advance. Like for example, with no more than three errors, if you are defining the quality, it may be something related to no more than three uh, errors. It can be, um, you know, very time bound also. So, tra training objectives are definitely very, very instrumental for the organizations to uh, take up the task in an effective manner. For example, uh, in a manufacturing company, the training manager decides to conduct a workshop on workplace safety without setting clear objectives. As a result, a lot of time was wasted and it lacked focus. So, if we are not defining our objectives well, the training program would definitely be lacking focus. And Participants would have to spend a lot of significant time discussing, discussing some of the unrelated and un, unrelated topics or sharing personal anecdotes, which would not serve the entire process, you know, which would not serve the entire process or purpose of, uh, you know, uh, the training objectives of the training program. So, the lack of clear objectives lead to inefficiencies and lot of wasteful movements as participants may not be able to achieve the intended learning outcomes. So, it is important to set your training objectives properly. Then it inhibits flexibility also. Uh, some may fear that rigid training objectives inhibit flexibility and creativity in delivering the training program. So, there are uh, people who are of this notion. In this context, I would like to uh, put an example. For example, there was a software development company which decided to provide training on very new programming language to its developers. However, the training uh, program, the training objectives are so narrowly defined, are so narrowly defined that they leave little room for exploration or experimentation. So, trainers feel constrained by the predefined objectives and are able to adapt the training content 
to adapt the uh, training content to uh, you know address the emerging trends or individual learning needs. So, it is very important for us to take care of certain points. Then uh, when we do not have a clear cut uh, training objective for the audience, then it tends to move the fo focus to some other areas also. right? And last but not the least is unrealistic for management training and other soft areas of training. So, therefore, we need to have the right kind of objectives in place and they need to be communicated to the people on time in an appropriate manner. Now, who are the important stakeholders in training? The very first important stakeholder in training is the trainer. So, when it comes to the trainer, trainer is an important stakeholder in the entire training program because he is the one who will actually put everything that is to be learned by the people into practice. So, it is very important for us to make sure that we have an appropriate trainer to communicate and to train the individuals at the right time. Then it is the training, their mindset, how would they perceive things, would they like it or not, would they, uh, would they, would they be coming with a positive mindset to learn something as a part of training or not is something again a very important thing. Then is the training designer. What kind of instructional methodologies are being made use of? How they are trying to take, uh, uh, you know, how, how they are trying to design the training program? What all elements are they including in the training program? What all constituents uh, do they really want to be a part of the training program? Would all be actually very instrumental in designing the training program. Therefore, the training designer has a very, very important role to play because the more interactive you make your training program to be, the more uh, you know visuals that you include in the training program, the more auditory things that you include in the training program would all be shaping your uh, you know training program in the best possible manner. And therefore, the training designer is an important stakeholder in the training program. Then is about uh, evaluator of the training. The one who is evaluating training is act and is the one who is actually assessing uh, and uh, trying to figure out what the, what did the training lack, what kind of improvements can be brought through the training program in the next training program which is delivered. So, all uh, these four important stakeholders would help us in understanding things in a better way. Now, we all are very well aware of the fact that there are uh, you know training mechanism and trainees can really benefit a lot from the objectives which they have set in place in number of ways and to name a few they are uh, instrumental in reducing the anxiety related to unknown because they know everything in advance. This focuses their attention on certain key takeaways and key objectives which they are expected to know. They increase the likelihood that trainees will be successful in the training. Now, the trainers also benefit with the objectives in multiple ways, in various uh, well defined ways. The training designer uh, is able to directly translate the training needs into the training outcomes and is able to understand things uh, in a better perspective when he has the objectives in mind. And example, a tra training designer is designed, is told to provide sales people with its skills in customer service. What should he do? Should he design the course for interpersonal skills or product knowledge? So, better knowledge of training objective would facilitate the entire process in a better manner. And uh, training evaluator gets to know about the yardstick against which he is supposed to measure the actual performance of the individuals. So, it is very important for us to facilitate the training with uh, deep focus on the training. Their motivation, their uh, knowledge, skills, abilities, their attitudes is something which would really be very, very helpful in facilitation of the training. When it comes to facilitation of training uh, in context of the trainee, there are few things that have to be uh, taken care of like for example, the implication of certain theories like conditioning and uh, classical conditioning and reinforcement theory, operate conditioning theory, classical conditioning theory, planning uh, for the reward at the lower level, knowing the things that your training would be seeing as rewarding. Uh, including some kind of challenges in the training program would all serve the purpose. Then when it comes to facilitation of training uh, with focus on training design, there are few theories which can be really instrumental. For example, uh, one being social learning theory, then we have attention and expectancy theory. Uh, focus on training design, 
So facilitation of training has to be done pr primarily related to the focus on training design. That is what should be the appropriate temperature in which the training must be given. Uh, how should uh, the distraction be eliminated? How should seating be done? What kind of uh, flexible and comfortable uh, environment should be created? How many breaks should be given? Refreshment, what kind of refreshment should be given to the individuals? Should they be given heavy refreshments or light refreshments? Of course, light refreshments are always preferred because uh, otherwise they start feeling very drowsy. Then alcohol-like things should be avoided during the training programs. Then we have something related to conditions of practice. Now, when it comes to conditions of practice, there are several techniques that can be followed. For example, we have masked versus spaced practice. So it's about training for four hours continuously or 0.5 hours for eight days. So both these things, the masked space practices, you know, they all have, they both have their own uh, uh, style and uh, they, uh, they both have their own pros and cons. So we have to evaluate it very wisely and see what would work the more, uh, what would work more. Then we have a condition of practice called as whole versus part learning. So it depends upon whether tasks can be logically divided into parts. So whole learning, uh, whole training devices are much easier as the design can be modeled after the real device. In several instances, whole learning is good, such as when intelligence of the training is very high, we will think of giving a whole learning experience to the individual. Whereas uh, in the other case, the practice which may be adopted maybe you know you may go for uh, part learning experience to the people so that they are able to assimilate things and then we move to the next thing so we have uh, several such things which are important to be taken care of and definitely there has to be a focus on organizational intervention also there has to be an adequate support guaranteed by the supervisors peers trainers reward system climate and culture in order to facilitate easy learning to the individual. With this, we come to the end of our uh, session and we extensively talked about how the training design should be taken care of, what all things should be bear in mind while designing the training program, what kind of fo focus should be placed on the trainer, trainee, learning interventions, organizational support, etc. And we also tried to touch upon some of the important principles of adult learning in today's session. With this, I would like to thank you.